Two months ago, the House Judiciary Committee overwhelmingly passed bipartisan legislation to reauthorize FISA Section 702. As was mentioned, the vote in the committee was 35 to 2. Mr. Biggs' bill, which was co-sponsored by Chairman Jordan, myself, and many others across the ideological spectrum, was a balanced first step towards reform. It was designed to preserve the intelligence committee community's ability to keep Americans safe while curbing the abuses that pose the greatest threat to our privacy. And, and I want to thank Mr. Jordan and Mr. Biggs for being strong partners in the effort to achieve reform. But Speaker Johnson failed to bring our bill up for a vote. Rather than putting a bill from the committee jurisdiction on the floor, he devised a scheme to pit it against a different bill in a series of competing votes. That strategy, which more res resembled the TV game show than regular order, failed spectacularly. Today's approach to FISA seems marginally improved, that we may actually get to the floor with an opportunity to reauthorize the serious legislation. But I should note that the Speaker's new plan, advancing a vanilla-based bill and asking us to vote on the controversial items individually with no time to review the amendments in advance is also highly suspect. The strategy is so unwieldy that if two or, if two or three of the expected amendments are adopted in combination, there may be nobody left to support the bill. Nevertheless, I hope that our bipartisan coalition shows that even under these circumstances, the time for real, real reform to Section 702 has come. The modest reforms in H.R. 7320, the Reforming Intelligence and Securing America Act, are indeed unobjectionable. They are also so modest that they would prove ineffective, and we have the numbers to back that up. In 2021, in response to repeated criticism from the FISA court, the FBI instituted internal reform for U.S. person queries of the 702 database. While these changes forced a 90 percent reduction in noncompliance, the FBI was still left with an average of more than 200,000 compliance incidents every year. The FBI's self-imposed query restrictions did not prevent searches for over 100 Black Lives Matter protesters. They did not prevent a batch, of, a batch query of over 19,000 donors to an unnamed congressional candidate. And they did not stop thousands of other noncompliant FBI queries of the 702 database that occurred in 2021. Instead of taking a step toward reining in these abuses, this milk with toast bill would simply codify the FBI's existing query rules and call it progress. But the status quo is not enough. 200,000 unlawful queries a year are simply unacceptable. The single most important reform we can enact to combat these abuses is a probable cause warrant requirement for U.S. person queries. Jim mentioned this. One of the amendments you will see today would impose such a warrant requirement on searches using U.S. person identifiers, with certain reasonable exceptions, such as for cybersecurity cases, situations with victim consent, and in exigent circumstances. This warrant requirement is the reform we need to protect Americans and to allow surveillance laws to continue to keep us safe while also protecting our essential liberties. Calls for even the, mo the most basic of FISA reforms often results in hand-wringing and fear-mongering from the intelligence community and even from some of my colleagues in the House. I've been told that probable cause is, quote, just too hard. Never mind that our law enforcement officers acquire probable cause warrants every day. I've been presented with absurd hypotheticals that I am told, quote, could not possibly fall under any exception, even though they clearly do. Earlier today, one of my colleagues suggested that, quote, if you are the victim of a cyber attack and a serious danger, a warrant requirement just takes too long, close quote. I want to thank him for naming all three exceptions to the warrant rule we propose. In a true emergency, in the case of a cyber attack or with the consent of the victim, yeah. the government can always act to keep us safe. The intelligence community's criticism of these important changes seems untethered to the actual text of the amendment. But this is nothing new. The parade of hypothetical horribles was tried it out when we ended bulk collection in 2015, and then again when the business records provision expired in 2019. The horribles never came to pass. The sky never fell. I also support two other amendments that I expect will be offered today. Again, Jim mentioned both of these. The Fourth Amendment is not for sale act would prohibit the government from buying its way around warrant requirements by purchasing cell phone location information and other highly sensitive data from data brokers. This is no idle concern. Just yesterday, Politico reported that one data broker has tracked the location of individuals visiting 600 Planned Parenthood locations that provide abortion care services. The other amendment would permanently end so-called 
quote, about collection by the NSA, in which the NSA can search not only communications to or from an intelligence target, but also communications that simply mention an identifier used by a target. Ending this practice should be easy, since the government voluntarily stopped this kind of surveillance in 2017, yet it is conspicuously absent from the underlying legislation. Without prohibiting about collection, the NSA could restart its program searching the content of all communications and significantly expanding both the scope of Section 702 and the volume of U.S. person information that falls into it. Finally, I would caution my colleagues to vote any, against any provisions that would expand the reach of Section 702, provisions that would broadly expand the types of communications that can be swept up in a 702 search, that would allow the use of 702 for vetting immigrants, that would expand the definition of foreign intelligence, would set our country's surveillance laws in the wrong direction. Moreover, each of these amendments would poison any attempt to reauthorize Section 702. For too long, FISA Section 702 has enabled the surveillance of Americans without adequate safeguards to protect our civil liberties. No one disagrees that our intelligence agencies play an essential role in keeping us safe. But it is unfair to expect that the individuals who carry the grave responsibility of rooting out terrorist threats should also be required to make judgments about how to protect the constitutional rights of those surveilled. Americans need Congress to enact the guardrails, real guardrails, not a simple codification of the status quo. With Section 702 expiring soon, we have a rare opportunity to provide those guardrails, to protect Americans' privacy while giving law enforcement the tools they need to keep us safe. I cannot support this legislation unless a probable cause warrant amendment is adopted. I encourage my colleagues to join me in supporting real reform. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you both very much. Uh, the chair has no questions at the moment. We actually have people on this uh, panel with considerable expertise and from the original Committee of Jurisdiction, so I'm going to defer to those. And I'll go first to my good friend. The ranking member do his opening statement. The ranking member? Oh, he has arrived. Oh, I had not, not, I'd gone the other way. So, yes, before we uh, go to questions, <coughs> if that's okay, I'll recognize my friend who's right off the floor. Uh, and was delayed in arriving here for whatever opening remarks he cares to make. <coughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, and so we're here, here we are. We're back again, and this time with the FISA bill. And uh, look, FISA desperately needs to be reformed. And I personally believe that the Reforming Intelligence and Security America Act is not the right way to do it. Uh, this bill does not include common sense reforms like closing the loophole that allows the FBI to purchase Americans' location data and other information from data brokers or requiring a probable cause warrant for searches of uh, Americans' private communications. It fails to address my concerns about Section 702, which authorizes warrantless surveillance uh, that, is supposed, that is supposed to only target non-U.S. persons outside the United States. But we know that for too long, Section 702 has been used for improper searches that have included donors to congressional campaigns, Black Lives Matter uh, protesters, and local and federal politicians. It also fails to address the state secrets privilege. Currently, a person can be blocked from accessing information in a lawsuit against them that the agency involved says could harm national security. This information is often obtained through Executive Order 12333 and Section 702 searches. Unfortunately, this privilege has been abused and used to prevent redress for people who have been wrongly charged. This bill could have addressed this issue by providing a form of redress for those who have been wrongly charged, but in, instead it ignores these, uh, this problematic abuse of authority altogether. And without addressing some of these critical reforms, this bill just reinforces the status quo. This is troubling and it's unacceptable. We should, we should be safeguarding people's privacy rights, and this bill, in my opinion, fails to do that. Aside from the actual policy, <coughs> I have to reiterate that this is the third time this Congress, uh, you know, um, has dealt with a, 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 this is the third time this Congress has had a, a Pfizer bill come to this committee for consideration. And I'm, ser I'm serious, uh, you know, uh, do you all know that, um, you know, I don't know if, you ha if you've done a vote count, but is, is, are the votes there for this? I mean, if we're spending time doing this at this particular point, given the fact there are some other pressing issues that require our attention. Uh, and I, I noted yesterday the House Freedom Caucus held a 
formal press conference voicing their opposition to this bill. Um, so with their track record so far, unless Republican leadership knows for certain that they have the votes, uh, I'm not sure what the point of bringing this uh, to our committee is or bringing it to the floor. But that's exactly the problem. Republicans would rather try to ram policies, often extreme policies, down the throats, uh, down our throats, despite the fact that uh, they are unpopular inside this body and they're unpopular with the American people. And despite the fact that the American people keep saying they don't want this extremism, and again, look at the election last night, people keep voting against extreme mega agenda. Uh, that's why Republicans lost last night. People are rejecting the most extreme approaches to policies. Uh, uh, and I, I think this would be a good time to pause and think about how we can improve this legislation so in a way that gets strong bipartisan support so it actually passes. Uh, I, I would hope that the Republican leadership would listen to the American people um, who are begging them to get something done. Again, we need to do something on this. Um, I think this is not the, the product that um, is the answer. Uh, and, um, you know, I want this chamber to function uh, more efficiently and more effectively. Uh, and um, and so I uh, anyway I appreciate you yielding to me to let me air some of my concerns, but uh, I have some problems with this. Well, I thank the gentleman for his statement, and as I said earlier, I have no questions. I'm going to yield to my friend and distinguished vice chair of the committee, Dr. Burgess, for any questions he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be relatively brief <clears throat> compared to what I normally do. Um, I appreciate our our witnesses working so hard on this because it is it is significantly important. I do have a question on section two, which is the query procedure reform, subparagraph B, prohibition of, on involvement of political appointees, um, and then the language prohibiting political appointees, fairly specific. <clears throat> but let me just tell you, I'm not so worried about the political appointees. I'm worried about the career people in the agencies because Pardon me for this observation, but most of them do not seem to be to the right of center in their political leanings. Most of them are significantly left. And I hear it all the time from my constituents back home. There are two, two systems of justice in this country. One, if you lean a little bit left, no harm done. Boys will be boys. Move on. Nothing to see here. And if you're to the right, we're locking you up in pretrial detention with uh, charges that seem almost Kafka-esque in their imagination. So I'm just as worried about the career people as I am the political point. In fact, I'm more worried about the careers because at least the political people, you know where they are. Uh, the others, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a mystery. Is, I mean, is that a fair assumption? No, it's a fair assumption. And I think you're, you're just underscoring the, the point that the ranking member and I made, and, and frankly, the ranking member of the Rules Committee made, it's why we need a warrant. It's, it, we can put all the reforms in there, and I'm for all the reforms, but in the end, the real check is to have a separate and equal branch of government weigh in on the process and not just have the FBI, which we know time after time, Black Lives Matter protesters, they were searching. People who were at the Capitol on January 6th, they were searching. 19,000 donors to a congressional campaign, a congressional ca a, a, a member of Congress himself. So that's why you need the warrant. And I'm right where Chair, our Ranking Member Nadler is. If the warrant requirement doesn't go in the legislation, I ain't supporting it. And I think there are a lot of people in that, in, that, in that position because we understand what's happened in the last several years, and we know it's wrong, and that's not how this great country is supposed to operate. Could I, uh, yes. could I come in? Mr. Burgess, I, Dr. Burgess, I really don't care whether the person in the government is leaning left, left of center or right of center. The point is they shouldn't have the power. Exactly. That's however they're leading. That's why we have the warrant requirement or, or the amendment for the warrant requirement. And let me be very blunt here. You've got two committees with two very different visions. The Judiciary Committee, almost unanimously, 35 to 2, very much wants a warrant requirement with the exceptions of emergencies, uh, 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 consent, and cybersecurity for obvious reasons wants to take care of the data brokering, too, so you don't get away with the warrant requirement, and wants to end the, the about collection so you don't reinstate it. We have those three things. Um, we've got a decent bill. The Intelligence Committee doesn't want those three things. They have three different amendments, which I hope are not made in order. Amen. These three amendments would go in the wrong direction. 
One expands the already expansive definition of foreign intelligence. One subjects new business to surveillance under Section 702. And one drags immigration into the debate by turning 702, Section 702 on anyone crossing our borders. Section 702 is intended for intelligence about foreign persons. It shouldn't be turned on immigrants. It shouldn't be turned on Americans. That's why we have the three amendments we are proposing. That's why the three amendments the Intelligence Committee are proposing should not be made in order and should not be adopted so that we have a system that protects us, but also protects our civil liberties. Well, obviously, the amendment part of this debate is going to be pretty lively, and, and it should be. It should be a robust discussion. I just can't get over the fact that in the Carter Page case, a FISA judge was lied to four times, and there was no accountability. General Flynn was suspected of lying to the FBI one time, and he's threatened with financial ruin and prison. But the four people, including the director of the FBI at the time, no harm, no foul, because they lied to a FISA judge to go after Carter Page. And that's just a, that's just a tough one to accept. You tell me that problem with the amendments now will fix that. Um, then I'm happy to support your bill. But it has, uh, I mean, that's, a, that's been a tough one to accept for a number of years that that could happen in this country. Well, I just, again, I'll just reiterate what, what uh, Ranking Member Nader said, that if, those, if the amendments that we're bringing forward are adopted into legislation, I think it's a good bill and something we should support because it protects Americans' interests, protects Americans' liberties, I should say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Now go to my good friend, distinguished Ranking Member. Uh, member, Mr. McGovern, for any questions he may have. Well, or thank you, Mr. Chairman. I aired my concerns um, at, 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 in my opening statement. I just will say that um, both the chairman and the ranking member make a lot of sense to me. And I'm not sure when the last time I said that was, but uh, so I. I uh, for the record, never. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I think that um, you know I I, I I I think we have some common concerns here, and hopefully we can we can address them appropriately. But I have no questions. Thank you very much. The gentlelady from Minnesota is recognized for any questions she may have for the panel. The gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized for any Thank questions you. she may have. As noted at the end of last year, we had a large and diverse coalition of Republicans and Democrats come together in judiciary uh, to pass one of the most significant reforms to government surveillance in decades. And our process was clear. It was transparent. Um, we went through a lengthy and discursive markup and ultimately passed a bill with near unanimous vote. Um, as noted, several of our colleagues on the Rules Committee are also members of the Judiciary Committee. And it's generally acknowledged that the Judiciary Committee is not usually a place where Democrats and Republicans see eye to eye, but we did. So in this incredibly important issue that impacts the civil rights of millions of Americans, we were able to come together on a bipartisan reform package. But that's not the FISA reauthorization package that um, is being put up for a vote today or tomorrow. And so I'm really surprised because so many of our Republican colleagues um, had shared our concerns about FISA and agreed on the reforms that were passed by the Judiciary Committee. So instead, we've got a brand new bill re released by the Speaker and the Intel Committee. Um, they're bypassing Judiciary Committee, where, as noted, there are specific concerns, particularly about American civil rights that are top of mind, um, and where we had specific objections to the constitutionality of the Intel bill's provisions. Um, the bill is now coming straight to rules with critical details to be worked out in House uh, floor votes on amendments. And it's kind of a vague promise that these incredibly conse consequential um, issues in the bill are just going to be developed by referendum. So it's not a good way to address these really critical issues. Um, and the bill itself falls short of the reforms that we need to protect Americans' privacy from spying and from commercial sale of data. Uh, given all that, um, it, it's not a bill that should move forward. Um, I hope that the House will do the right thing on FISA reform um, when we get to vote on the important amendments. And I just have to say, during the decades where I represented folks through legal services and such, um, 
usually low-income Americans, I frequently heard from courts and opponents that due process and observance of people's civil rights would slow things down and be too burdensome. Uh, this is another such situation. Um, I have not seen anything to persuade me that the burdensomeness or the um, slowing of process in other than emergency situations or defensive situations or the um, exceptions that have been carved out here, um, that those concerns rise to anything that should allow us to waive the Fourth Amendment. So um, I think we need to take all that on consideration. I wish we were pursuing the judiciary version here, and I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for any questions he may have for the panel. I thank the chairman of the Rules Committee. Um, you know, we're aware of so many abuses of the FISA 702 program now that we weren't aware of years ago, and I'm sure Chairman John Conyers and, and uh, Ranking Member Jim Sensenbrenner, when they put this into place in 2008, didn't anticipate the ways that this would be abused. But now that it, we know it's been abused, even the agencies are telling us that they've abused it. Not once, not twice, not a hundred times, not a thousand times, but 278,000 times it's been found to be abused. And given all of that, and given what we know, I think we would be derelict in our oath of office, where we, we swear to uphold and defend the Constitution if we did a, a clean reauthorization of FISA or anything close to it. Uh, we have to address these issues, and we can't take their word for it from the FBI anymore. We promise, we double, you know, we double promise um, that we will not abuse this again. They're, they've tried to assure us that they have protocols in place. Protocols are not warrants. Like our, our founding fathers had got this right when they said that everybody's going to be secure in your uh, place and effects and your personal belongings. Then when they enshrined our privacy in the Constitution and said you have to get a warrant and have probable cause. If you want, if the government wants to surveil citizens, those are the things that you have to have. And, uh, you know, they've erected this legal scaffolding that I think is some of the shakiest scaffolding I've ever seen, uh, where they say that it's legal, what they're doing is legal right now. But let me, let me summarize what they're doing. They are using the FISA, this is Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, not domestic Intelligence Surveillance Act. It's FISA, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and they're targeting people who don't have constitutional rights. I'm fine with that. Vladimir Putin doesn't have constitutional rights. Uh, Merkel doesn't even have constitutional rights, okay? Not in this country. Now, if she visits, we'll afford her some rights, but anybody who's not a U.S. citizen who is not inside of the United States doesn't have those rights, and so we can spy on them. And I'm fine with that. And, and nobody here is talking about stopping that at all. What we're talking about is a program that right now, was, it was designed to target foreigners. It is, being target, it is targeting foreigners. But it is harvesting massive, massive amounts of data and incidentally collects our information, our communications, members of Congress, donors to members of Congress, just you know, regular constituents who get up and go to work. They get swept up in this. And uh, what they're saying now with this legal scaffolding is because we, we collected it legally, we can legally go in there without a warrant and search for Americans. There's a problem with that. Yes, Mr. Nadler. Yeah, I, I, just, I agree with you. Turn your microphone. It is on. OK. I agree with you completely, and I, I simply want to say, the bill before us is totally inadequate. You're going to hear, after Jim and I leave, you're going to hear from the Intel Committee. They're going to tell you exactly the opposite. Yeah. We, the, the, the Judiciary Committee has proposed three amendments. The warrant requirement, the data broker uh, uh, amendment, and the about collection. Yep. I've spoken about it, though. If those amendments are adopted, it's a good bill. It protects, it, it allows for the for the proper collection of intelligence that protects Americans' civil liberties. The Intel, and, and I hope the committee makes those amendments in order. The Intel Committee has three amendments that go in the opposite direction. 
One expands the already expansive definition of foreign intelligence. One subjects new business to surveillance under Section 702. And one drags immigration into the debate by turning Section 702 on anyone who crosses our borders. Those three amendments go in the wrong direction. If they are adopted, we may not be able to support the bill. If the, we certainly can't support the bill without the warrant, but even with the warrant, if, if some of these amendments are adopted, they call the bill into question. I hope the committee will make the three Judiciary Committee amendments in order and the three Intel Committee amendments that I just mentioned not in order so we can improve the bill on the floor tomorrow. I have a better odds of improving the bill on the floor and being able to pass a bill that does what we need to do for intelligence and protects our civil liberties. Well, this, this is a rare occurrence, and I don't, hope it's not too common, but I find nothing to disagree with in your testimony. <laughs> uh, Mr. Jordan, Chairman Jordan, can you, can you go through what those three amendments, three or four amendments, I don't know how many judiciary is offering, yep. and I know we're going to hear from those sponsors later, yep. but can you just briefly summarize what those are and why they're important? The, the, we're gonna, we're, we got the warrant requirement, probable cause warrant requirement. We have the first, uh, Fourth Amendment's not for sale which is in essence a warrant-like issue because it says you can't, the federal government can't go purchase data that would otherwise require a warrant to get. From and then, then we get rid of about collection, which is if people that are being targeted, they talk about someone, you can't, you can't collect that information. That hasn't been in operation for uh, seven years. We just want to say if you haven't done it for seven years, you should end it. Um, so those are the three key amendments that, that we have coming forward that we think help. But... I would just point out, you're exactly right, uh, uh, Congressman. Protocols and process by the executive branch do not equal a warrant by a separate and equal branch. That's why we have our system. We, we, are, we are literally talking about the fundamentals here. And then when you put in what we've learned, as you pointed out, since 2008, where there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of targets our government has that they're surveilling. Those people talk to all kinds. Some of them are just like diplomats from friendly, like you mentioned Merkel or her, the assistant who works for Merkel, th th those kind of things. They're collecting all kinds of communications. And guess how many times they searched that communication data on U.S. persons in 2021? They said, here's the estimate we got from the Justice Department. Estimate, 3,394,053. That's how many times they searched this giant haystack of information that they're collecting on Americans. And all we're saying is if you're going to do that on an American, go get a warrant, which the ranking member rightly pointed out happens every stinking day in this country. Every day they go, law enforcement gets warrants. That's all we're saying. That's the protection. And oh, by the way, if there's an emergency exigent circumstance, you, you don't have to get the warrant. Or if you go to the person and say, we think you're being targeted by a foreign government, will you give us your consent? You can give your consent. Or if they know it's some kind of malware that they, they know a distinctive uh, cybersecurity threat, the malware, they can say, we can go, that's an exception. I don't know how better we could write the amendment than that. But that's how we, that, the, and to Ms. Scanlon's point, I argued for bringing our bill up. We're the Committee of Jurisdiction. Bring the bill that came out 35 to 2, put that on the floor, and let you guys on the Rules Committee make and order the amendments that the Intelligence Committee wanted to change things. That's how the process is supposed to work. We argued for the normal process. But our leadership decided, no, they want to do it this way. Okay, fine. Then let's make sure our amendments get in order. More important, let's hope our amendments pass tomorrow on the floor. Now, you mentioned there were 3.3 million searches using American person identifiers. How many of those were done according to the FBI's own protocols uh, wrongly? 278,000. 278,000. Then, and what kind of things were they searching for when they when they went in there two hundred seventy eight thousand times no, out no, of three it, million? It could have been it could have been a violation of some process. It could have been you know you didn't check this box, you didn't do that. It, it could have been a, a variety of, of reasons why it didn't comply with the rules the FBI put in themselves. I think the, the the more fundamental fundamental point is they didn't follow their own rules, and so I, that's why I said at the outset of my testimony. That's why I think it's not just good enough to say oh we have better rules. For them to follow. Well, you can have the best rules in place, but if they already demonstrated that they won't follow them, you, that's not enough. It's why you need a warrant. And how many people do we think are able to search this database? Well, domestically. I'm not talking about CIA, NSA. 
FBI, yeah, DOJ. Well, we, were in, we were in a briefing, uh, and it wasn't classified briefing, where they told us it could be upwards of 10,000. Now, this the underlying legislation, which, again, has some good reforms in it, uh, limits that number dramatically. We think it's now down below 1,000, but it's still a relatively big number. But it's much better than what it was, what it would be, you know. With thousands of chances for somebody to, to basically violate the Constitution, and you've got to have another branch of government watching over this. You can't have the same branch watching itself. That's why you need the warrant. Yep. That's why you need the warrant, exactly. Let me talk a little bit about the process, because I'm disappointed in it, too. I'm a, a, a believer in a good process. And um, I went back and looked, and it was actually J Chairman John Conyers and, and Ranking Member Jen Sensenbrenner who put FISA 702 into place in 2008. It was their bill, and they managed it on the floor. And, uh, you know, judiciary created a very good product that has the warrant in it, has provision to keep the government from buying information they would otherwise need a warrant for, has a, a lot of other good safeguards in it. In my opinion, that should have been the bill that was on the floor. We could have an open process here. Intel could offer as many amendments as they want. And by the way, I don't want to downplay, they do have some jurisdiction in there in the FISA bill, but it's the outward focused portion of it, not the part of it that's been turned on American citizens. Like when we're talking about who has jurisdiction over what, you know, we're not in judiciary claiming that we need to oversee the CIA and, and what they're doing overseas. And Intel should not be, you know, uh, trying to say that they have authority or jurisdiction over when you need a warrant to spy on an American who's living in America, yeah. using information that somebody else has collected, that um, not domestically, not with a warrant. Oh, I mean, that's the other, one of the other fallacies. They say they collected all of this information legally. Yes, that is true. But you didn't collect it with a warrant because you were surveilling foreigners. So you can't then take that, that giant haystack, as you said, and it's enormous. Yep. I don't think people have an appreciation for how much data is there and, and, and how much of your private information is contained in this haystack. And... and uh, Ms. Sparks has, has mentioned earlier, too, that we don't even know about their minimization procedures. Okay, let's say you want to target somebody in Afghanistan, okay? Well, maybe there's only one ISP in Afghanistan, and you can get all of the emails that come in and out of Afghanistan. How do we know that if your email didn't go through there or copy somebody in Afghanistan, that you're not in that giant haystack. How do we know that they're minimizing this data that they're trying to collect on what they say are legitimate targets? I don't, I don't know that we know. But okay, so we got this process. It should have been the judiciary bill. It's not the judiciary bill. It probably tracks closer to the intel bill, the base text. There are some uh, provisions in here that we can all agree are probably good things. But um, if you remember the Judiciary Committee, you know this does not go far enough. We had an open and robust debate for hours when we marked up our bill and, and ultimately included the warrant provision, ultimately included Mr. Davidson's the Fourth Amendment is not for sale, ultimately included a lot of other stuff that should have been in the base bill. But what we got now is, is a different base text and we're going to hear a good debate over this. Um, and then we're going to have some votes on these amendments. And, and that's the good thing about this process, Mr. Chairman, is that we, we, are, we do have a rule here that uh, we don't know what the rule's going to be yet. I'm kind of waiting myself to see the final form and to make sure that what we've talked about is what becomes. Um, but we're going to have a process here where every member of Congress who's present and um, I think we had, was how many voted last night? You know, maybe 430. Every one of those is going to be here this week. And they, and they stand in front of God and country and their constituents, and they're going to be taking votes on whether they think you need a warrant to go get this information. Yes, Mr. Chairman. If I could, uh, Congressman Massey. And I think that will be the first time that the House of Representatives will have an opportunity to go on record for requiring a warrant for the 702 program. So that is why that amendment is critical, that 
it be made in order, and let's hope it wins, but there's a chance for, in front of God and everybody, the American people can say, who in the United States Congress believes that you should get a warrant if you're going to go look at Americans' information? So it's interesting you bring up the, you know, the statistic. Is this the first time we've had a vote on whether you should get a warrant or not? We've had similar votes. Uh, Ms. Lofgren and I have sponsored these yep. uh, in the appropriations process. But what we were told in that process is this is not the proper time and place to bring up the warrant in the appropriations process. The, you know, these limitation amendments, they've got parliamentary restrictions, they're blunt instruments, and if you want to legislate this properly, you need to do it in the Judiciary Committee. So I got on the Judiciary Committee, <laughs> and then we got to do this, and we, we got a great bill, and we bring it to the floor, and we're told, no, we're going to substitute it with something else, but we'll give you a fair shake at this with some amendments downstream, which we're okay with that. We, we need to win the argument in the debate. But to your point, Mr. Jordan, we've, we've had some proxy votes. We've had some approximations of what we're going to do this week. But they always said, wait for this moment. Wait for the reauthorization of FISA. And that is the proper time and opportunity to include this warrant provision. Yep. Now, I would argue that we had a constitution, we've been in a constitutional crisis for quite some time, and that the right time was immediately. But here we are, you know, uh, just as Congress often does, we don't do much of anything until something expires. And nobody's talking about wanting to let this expire. Nobody's saying this is, this is a, a, a tool that we should deprive our outwardly focused intelligence agencies who try to keep this country safe from foreigners. What we're saying is it's been abused. It's been turned the same tools that we use on Russians and Chinese and Iranians, we're using on our own people. The same database, we're going in there and we're fishing for Americans' information in violation of the Constitution, and that's wrong. So I think this, I'm glad to see this is coming to the floor, uh, assuming this rule is made in order and it's a good rule and it, and it passes on the floor. I'm glad to see we're having this debate. Uh, I'm glad to see that finally people aren't saying, well, wait, wait six years, and we'll address this in six years. Well, some people are. Some people are saying there's nothing wrong with it right now. In, in stark contrast to the reports that we get from the IGs, for the, you know, the inspector generals, from, from the, D, the DOJ, the FBI, that this thing has been abused. So uh, I hope we do, Mr. Chairman, I, I hope we do make these amendments in order that give everybody a, a fair shake at voting on this, these issues that have for way too long. I've been here, not as long as you, Mr. Nadler or Mr. Jordan, but I've been here almost 12 years now, and they keep saying, wait, wait your turn. This is the time. I, I, I believe we're going to put a rule in place that gives us a robust debate and lets us have this, have this vote, and hopefully we, we carry the day. But I agree with... Uh, the ranking member of judiciary and the chairman of judiciary that this bill without amendments does not go far enough in, a, in, the, in the most consequential flaw in the reauthorization is the lack of requiring a warrant to, to go into that database and spy on Americans using information that's already been collected on foreigners. Uh, so with that, I hope, I hope we make these amendments in order. I hope everybody gets a, a good uh, debate on it, and I, and I hope that the ones that the chairman and the ranking member of judiciary support will pass and become part of the underlying bill so that I can support it. But I will say that um, it's not supportable in its current form. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. As the gentleman knows, we've uh, had a number of good rules that have not made it uh, True. Uh, so uh, we hope people understand the rule is to facilitate the very kinds of choices and debate uh, that uh, I know you all want and uh, I think the Congress will benefit from. Uh, with that, I'll go to my good friend from New Mexico and recognize her for any questions she may have for the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you uh, uh, to our chair and our ranking member. I have learned a lot. Uh, I've learned a lot today about Pfizer. I've learned a lot in this discussion. Uh, and I think what I'm hearing, and I think what everybody agrees on, is we need to protect American security interests. 
Uh, we need to reauthorize uh, FISA, if I'm understanding everybody's agreements. Uh, and what I'm also hearing is a ranking member and a chair uh, in a bipartisan manner coming before this committee and saying, we actually agree on three very important things that you are telling us, if I'm understanding correctly. Yep. That there are three amendments you would like to see made in order, uh, robust discussion about those amendments on the floor, and the ability of the members to vote, which is our job. And so it's really the rules committee at work. It's the legislative process at work. Uh, it, is, it is very elucidating. Um, I heard, uh, and my apologies as I was walking in, you know, we get pulled in so many directions. I heard our ranking member say that without these three amendments, you think it's a bad bill and you would not support it. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, my, I, I said I apologize. What is your position if the three amendments are either not made in order or voted down? Well, I hope Was it two amendments? The three, I hope all three are made in order. I support all three, but the most important one in my mind is the is the fundamental warrant requirement. If that's not part of the bill, then I wouldn't. I mean, if that doesn't isn't adopted on the floor and part of the bill, I wouldn't support the legislation. I think it's that fundamental. Okay, thank you. And you know, like I said, I, I I'll continue to to listen and learn on this matter, and I do hope that we'll be able to have those debates and that the rule, which we haven't seen yet, um, but that would include that opportunity to continue this. Beautiful bipartisan conversation that we're having, ranking member. As I said, I don't know whether you were in the room when I said it. Um, you're going to hear from the Intel Committee after we leave. I did. And they're going to urge you not to adopt the amendments that we're putting forward. And they're going to urge you to adopt three other amendments, which I will urge you, and I think Jim would urge you, yes. not to make an order. Uh, these amendments would expand the definition of foreign intelligence, subject new business to surveillance under Section 702 and make anyone crossing our borders subject to seven, Section 702 surveillance. These three amendments are go in the wrong direction, and I hope they're not made in order. If they're made in order, we'll try to defeat them on the floor, but I hope they're not made in order. And uh, the three amendments that, uh, that we're proposing are made in order. And, and I agree with Jim, the, the fundamental the three amendments that we're proposing are all important, but the fundamental one is the warrant requirement. The warrant requirement, right. Yeah, and I think other, the other two really just um, uh, the data brokers is a way of enforcing uh, a, a work around the warrant requirement. It says you, you can't get around the warrant by buying information from data brokers. So that, that's, that really is part of the warrant yeah. requirement. And uh, uh, the about collection is just to codify what they haven't been doing for. 12 years, I think, and shouldn't start doing it again. Okay, thank you very much. And I think the whole issue around data brokers, we keep seeing that this is a very big problem and we haven't really taken action yet in the United States in a variety of areas with regards to the amount of data that's collected on us on a base, every second, right? Every second, like we have these phones out and unwittingly we are giving yes. away way too much information, but. Going it's on, one thing member. for them to use it to decide which advertising to direct at us. It's another thing to uh, subject us to uh, spying, right. which is the point of this. Right. Uh, uh, Chairman, you were going to add to the well, conversation? I, I think it's a fundamental question. The three amendments that the Judiciary Committee are bringing forward would limit 702 in a way that we think is entirely consistent with our checks and balances and with our Constitution. The amendments the Intelligence Committee are bringing forward would expand 702. Expand 702 in light of the abuses we have seen, 3 million queries, 278,000 times they didn't follow their previous rules, their current rules, I don't think makes sense. Do you want to limit it and protect Americans' liberties, or do you want to expand it? That's the fundamental question on the, on the six amendments that are three from the Intel Committee and three from ours. So, so if, you know, if, if, if coming out of here you have all six amendments going to the floor because of robust, let's say we head in that direction, there is, an op there is a possibility of having a bill that has conf conflicting uh, provisions? There is a possibility, yes. And as I said in my opening statement, I don't know if you were here, there's a possibility of having a bill that nobody supports. Because mm -hmm. everybody finds something obnoxious in it. It, it all depends. Yeah. An, an, an interesting quandary. I look forward to continuing to learn more. And I, I truly do. Uh, I wasn't in the room, but uh, I, 
we, we had it on and we were listening and following. Is there anything else that you had wanted to add? Well, the, the, the one thing that you mentioned that made me think of um, is there's going to be a, this is how the Congress is supposed to work. Because tomorrow there's going to be a one hour rule debate. There's going to be one hour debate where the judiciary controls time. There's going to be another hour debate when the Intel Committee controls time. And there's going to be several amendments, I believe, if the, that's up to the Rules Committee, if they're made in order. So we could have four hours of debate on this issue, which frankly is probably what needs to happen in the United States Congress when you're talking about something this fundamental and this important. That's going to, that's going to play out tomorrow. That's probably the kind of time this body should devote to something this important. Well, you know, I was on the floor of the House today managing a rule, which I didn't think was the most important thing that we could have taken up. So I'm really looking forward to us having the robust discussion that we'll be having on this tomorrow. Uh, and I thank, the, I thank you once again. I thank the members for their questions that they've been asking. I've been learning a lot from uh, my colleagues on the committee as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Thank you very much. Now I'll go to my good friend from Pennsylvania for any questions he may have for the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I just want to thank both uh, gentlemen for appearing today and uh, say I appreciate all the hard work you both put into this bill. And for the sake of time, Mr. Chairman, I'm just going to yield back. Okay. Now uh, we'll next go to my good friend from South Carolina for any questions he may have to the uh, Thank both of you, panel. Chairman Nadler and Chairman uh, Jordan. One question. You know, we all know we saw – had a front row seat to what they did to Donald Trump, what they did to the dossier that was just fake. Um, Chairman Jordan, you heard at caucus today, you had several law enforcement um, members got up and said that with the warrant issue, timing was important, and this is, was a delay in getting, well, I think that's what they were saying. Uh, and I'm sure Intel will, I, I guess, will cover that. Give me, and both of you, give me your thoughts on that. It's why we put exceptions in, in, in the warrant language. We says if there's a, a reasonable belief that this extenuating circum, exigent circumstances, there's an emergency happening, you can, you can bypass the warrant. Now, again, I, I have concerns about that sometimes, but we felt that was appropriate to deal with that situation. There's also two other, other exceptions. If, if the FBI thinks that, I use the example, if they think Mr. Nadler is a target of a foreign government, they can go ask him, do you want us to search this to, in a way to be helpful to, to whoever they're, they're talking to? So you can consent, and that's an exception. And then if there's some cyber known cybersecurity threat, like some malware that's been used before to, to uh, mess up a hospital's records or a bank or you know, whatever, they can, they, can, they can search Americans for, for uh, they can do a query without getting a warrant there. So we think the way we've drafted this, this uh, Warrant is exactly the right way to do it, consistent with tough circum or difficult circumstances, but also consistent with 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 the Constitution. And every complaint we've heard about it, uh, we think is answered by these three exceptions. And you don't think the exceptions could be abused over and over again, where the effect would be the same as not having a uh, not having a warrant? No, no, no. The the warrant requirement is a very strict yep. uh, requirement. And if you're going to get rid of it, there has to be an emergency. Um, I suppose it could be after the fact litigation about whether there was an emergency, but it, it's unlikely if there's a real emergency. Okay. There would be a well, thank, thank both, both of you for your work with this. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman from Texas, recognized for any questions he might have for our panel. Well, I thank both the chairman and the ranking member uh, and for your all's work on this and, and uh, would concur with my colleague from Kentucky and others who have noted the rarity of the uh, significant amount of agreement on this. But, but we joke about it, and we should, we should frankly, marinate it in it for a minute. Yeah. And the point that the ranking member is making about what we're going to hear on the next panel, which I, I will take at their word will be well-intended, but the extent to which it is going to diverge from what these two gentlemen are saying and what we're saying here on a bipartisan basis to ensure that we are protecting the civil liberties of the American people, notwithstanding the concerns that are no doubt going to be laid before us by the Intel Committee, usually, I'm going to say somewhat cynically and pejoratively, cloaked in all of the mystery of intelligence, meaning it's hard to attack. It's, it's, and it's designed with a cloak very purposely to make it difficult to attack because we're trying to speak in very real terms about the civil liberties of the American people, things that we are very... Uh, familiar with, I as a former federal prosecutor, for example, 
I've had to deal with these in real time, right? And had two different cases uh, in which I had different events occur where I was arguing to get evidence in and was successful and it was the right thing and I had to go to court, but it took a lot of work to get the evidence in, to demonstrate and prove that it was properly obtained. And I believe it was good and we put that bad guy in jail. There was another guy, I had a phone and the cop had taken the information off the phone. We had all these pictures, all this great evidence. I mean, extraordinary evidence of guns and drugs and gang activity, but he didn't get a warrant. The phone was just, it was incidental. They grabbed it when they, you know, there'd been a stop and we didn't have a right to look at the phone. So we couldn't use it. It was horrible for me from the standpoint of I had this great evidence. I wanted to go after this very, very bad guy, but I couldn't do it. That's important. It's really important. And it's important that we have judges that will enforce that on prosecutors because left to their own devices, law enforcement, lawyers who want to go get a bad guy, they're going to go do that. And nine times out of 10, it might be well-intended. Or maybe it's eight, maybe it's seven, I don't know. But the fact is, it can't, it, we can't give up the protections in order to seek, as our friend uh, Mr. Armstrong said in a meeting this morning, I'm going to quote him because he's not here, I shouldn't have said that, but colleague, uh, pointed out, and notably, the extent to which uh, it is obviously beneficial for us to have all of the information we could possibly have on everybody at any given moment in order to go pursue evil or bad actors. It'd be great, right? You can't just run around, as I think he pointed out, with dog sniffers running up to every single house to see if you can find drugs. Mm -hmm. you, you, this would turn our entire system on its head. And yet, that's what our intel community brothers and sisters want us to do. And that's wrong. And it's wrong no matter what that means, frankly. Yes, we need a balance here. All of us look at this with the, with the seriousness and the resolve of trying to strike balance. But I would just ask now, the, uh, the, both of the gentlemen, that there's a long, laundry list of things that are included in the underlying bill. Let me back up for a minute. Do each of, of, of the two gentlemen, the chairman and the ranking member, believe that the underlying bill from judiciary, the, the committee of jurisdiction, would be the proper bill for us to be moving forward with? If you had your choice and do you think it is a better product than either the Intel Committee product or the compromise product that is currently before us? Yes. Yes. And do you think that should be the bill we start from if you had your choice? Yes, if we had our choice, but that's not what's happening. Yeah. Okay, so the bill that we have before us is a compromise product, uh, the product of a committee. I'm going to pause for a second. We've raised a number of issues in this committee about process over the last year. Some good, some bad. Learn some, you kind of go as you go. But the whole goal has been to try to improve the process, open things up, bring bills forward, be able to amend them. And we've hit some walls along the way. Uh, but this, I would argue, is somewhere in between, right? This is not what I would argue the best pro product. The best product here would be to take the Judiciary Committee product, the Committee of Jurisdiction, bring it forward, debate it, amend it, Intel guys want to bring forward amendments, make them in order, and then take it to the floor. That would be what I think is the proper process. And, and I raised this on the question of the rules process and, like, what is the proper way to do these things? This is, I would consider, if I'm being gracious, a hybrid that is not just slamming something down up here as just some product that was cooked up behind you know, closed doors by one individual, by a leader, dropping it on the floor and saying, okay, you guys vote on it. This was done with three people from each intel and judiciary in a room, sit there, find out what they can agree to, and then cook up some possible process to get certain amendments made in order. Okay, I'm just saying that for the beauty of the American people to understand what happened here, that's what happened. This is a quasi cooked up behind closed door bill. Now we're gonna take that bill and then we're gonna say we're allowed the base text, which we can talk about in a minute, and three or four amendments from each group, maybe six or seven amendments, and that's it. We're not opening it up. We're going to say those are the amendments. And then we got to put those on the floor and then decide what that's going to mean for the future of civil liberties and security for the American people. In that context, and given that background, I want to start with how uh, good is the underlying product? What are some of the things that you would say are actually good in the underlying product? And how is the underlying product deficient? without amendment. Obviously, I know the, the, the warrant issue, but just in broad terms, like for example, this underlying product, to the best of my knowledge, has a number of things in it, like requiring the FBI to obtain uh, prior approval from supervisors or attorneys before making any query using a United States person query term, prohibiting political appointees from being involved in the process, requiring mandatory audits for the United States person queries conducted by the FBI. I've got a list of like 20 things. Yeah. 
And those things, I guess we would agree, do improve the current system. Would, would, would each of the gentlemen agree that those are modest improvements on the current system? I would say yes. And, and we'll get to the comma, however. But yeah. yeah, no, but I would just say yes. And I mean, I can do this later, but I, I just view the whole thing as while it's not the process that I think some of us would prefer, I still see the glasses half full. Right. Because we are going to, I believe, if this committee makes an order, and I think this committee is going to make an order, the Warren Amendment and the other two that we think are so critical, we're going to get a chance for the first time to vote on those on the House floor. So I, I see. The underlying bill as the glass is half full. I see the amendments as definitely the glass is half full if those are part of the made part of the rule and we get to vote on those on the on the, on the I think what I, what I would say without going through the entire list here is what I'm trying to get at is that the half glass uh, the glass half full uh, thing, which is there are an, a large number of things that are modest improvements that get that glass uh, half full. Uh, maybe it's reduction from 5,000 people having access to this stuff to several hundred, yeah. right? Um, maybe it's uh, requiring FISC to produce transcripts of certain proceedings and to provide Congress with the opportunity to review those transcripts, requiring summary justifications in the case of applications to extend existing FISA orders, requiring the removal or suspension of federal officers who commit misconduct before FISC. There are things in here, right, that move the ball down the field. I say that to say, in terms of the context of what we have to decide in the Rules Committee and then on the floor, okay, that's moved down the field. Now here's the critical question that, that the, the chairman just alluded to, and, I, and I'd like to hear the views of the ranking member as well. I, I think, how, how short is it? I think it moves, to use a football analogy, because yeah. you were saying moving down the field, it moves it from the zero yard line to the five yard line. Not much. It makes minor changes to five that you've mentioned some of them. It doesn't deal with any of the basic problems. It would have been better if they'd taken the, you know, from a process point of view, if they'd taken our bill. Mm -hmm. They didn't. So let's deal with the situation we have. The situation we have is we have a bill that makes a very minor changes, moves the bill a little in the right direction, but is still wholly, wholly inadequate and does not protect the civil liberties of the American people. The three amendments that the Judiciary Committee is advancing would make this bill protect the civil liberties of the American people and provide all the necessary in intelligence without, without compromising the intelligence. And that's why I urge the committee to make these three amendments in order. The three amendments that you're going to hear from the in uh, Intel Committee go in the wrong direction. And I would urge that they not be made in order. If they are made in order, we'll have to debate them on the floor, hopefully defeat them. If some of them pass, we may have to defeat the whole bill. Um, it, it, I assume the chairman concurs with what the ranking member just articulated? Oh, yeah. If, I mean, we got to have the three. <laughs> and, and, can, and here's something I think is critically important. We've heard arguments uh, from some of our colleagues, probably, presumably on both sides of the aisle, but notably from, from uh, the GOP side of the aisle today, that, uh, that this is somehow a second warrant requirement as one of our colleagues articulated that this morning. That in other words, it is already lawful, this was the framing that I was presented with, to collect this information, right? But I think that misses a really important part of this, right? And I, both of you alluded to it, but I want to answer it in that context here uh, for those listening around the building. That this uh, <coughs> system under 702 lawfully collects information outwardly Right? Exactly right. But the key point here is then how can it be used for and toward and about American citizens? Yep, that's right. Or for persons in the United States, uh, to, be, to be more specific. And so could you both expand on that? It's, it's, this, it's, is the, it's, this is the critical question, it is, right? It is, it is the question. Our basic principle, and I, I think, uh, uh, who was it who said that before? I don't remember. One, one of the members of the Judiciary Committee, in fact, I think it was Mr. Massey. It was Thomas, I think. I think it was Mr. Massey, said, we can spy on non-American citizens in Moscow or in London or wherever. They have no constitutional rights. An American citizen, or for that matter, someone visiting the United States, has constitutional rights. 702 is designed to enable us to collect information about foreigners elsewhere. Inevitably, in collecting that information, you're going to 
get information about Americans, because Americans make phone calls overseas, whatever. You shouldn't be able to use that information without the standard way you use information for any purpose, which is to say with a warrant. So we provided the warrant requirement, which is fundamental, and we provided uh, uh, three exceptions to the warrant requirement to make it workable, the emergency, the consent, and the cybersecurity. We've put in the data broker thing just so you can't circumvent the warrant requirement. And that's what we're doing. Now, these amendments from the Intel Committee go in the wrong direction and would submit American citizens under certain circumstances to surveillance without a warrant. And that's why they should be rejected. Yeah. I would sure. just add, I think sometimes we forget what the F in FISA stands for. It's for foreign intelligence. And so, of course, it's collected lawfully because you're collecting it on a foreigner. There's no requirement for a warrant or anything when you go get information on a foreigner. But then when you're going to use that information that brings in an American, a U.S. person, as the ranking member said, you need to get a warrant if you're going to use that. Would anything in this underlying bill, plus the adoption of the amendments that we're discussing, particularly the warrant requirement, would anything in those hamper or restrict the government's ability to use 702 to target foreigners like you just described? No. no. Wouldn't at all, correct? Not at, Not at all. And what it would do, however, is, is ensure that you've got the protection of a warrant and your protection of your, your constitutional rights, uh, particularly as a, as a citizen, or as, or as the ranking member points out, if you're here in the United States. With yes, the exception of an emergency situation. Which, which I was about to add to. Go ahead. No, it, I mean, that, that you've said it well, but we even built that exception in. And in, 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 and to take that further, so you're, you've got bad actors here in the United States, okay, citizens or not. Uh, if, if we have uh, the um, uh, information about these individuals, right, there's nothing that would prohibit them from being able to go to present that. So somebody's cavorting with terrorists in some form. They're sharing information with Hamas. They're otherwise engaged with activity that would uh, present... Uh, uh, either imminent harm or whatever the language is, I don't have it in front of me, that, 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 would, uh, that would trigger an exception to the warrant requirement, or be able to actually get the warrant because they're actually engaged in criminal activity, because they're actually engaged with terrorists. Good point. If you think that some, if you have good reason to believe, probable cause to believe that someone is engaged in terrorism, or that someone is planning to rob a bank, right. you get a warrant. And it's no different. It's exactly the same thing. All we're doing is basically applying basic constitutional American law and we're providing for the three emergencies that, that we've mentioned several times. I know that we've talked about a couple of the other amendments, and I'll be mindful of time here. I know we need to move. But uh, Mr. Mr. Jordan, could you expand just a little bit on, so we've talked a lot about the warrant requirement, but we also have Mr. Davidson's amendment, which I believe you, he'll probably have time to present later. But the extent to which why that's an important piece of this and was adopted in the context of our debate in the Judiciary Committee yeah. and why that's critically important, because there's a lot of arguments that say, oh, what's not germane? It's like, well, hold on a second. Committees of jurisdiction make determinations all the time. We bring bills before this committee all the time that have amendments that come in, we adopt them in the committee, and then that becomes the base product, regardless of whether or not that particular amendment might have had some touching to another committee's jurisdiction. We do that. And so my, my question to you is, why is that amendment valuable? Well, to, to your point, it was in the, in the bill that we passed out of the committee. So it was part of the, the, the underlying legislation that, that we passed, again, 35 to 2. And then I would also argue it's, it's consistent with what we've been talking about. It's consistent with the warrant requirement because it says you cannot allow the federal, have the federal government be able to go purchase information that would otherwise require a warrant. So this whole focus on the warrant is is entails and brings in that concept as well. And that's why we felt it was appropriate. That's why we put it in the underlying bill that came out of the committee. And, and that's why we'd and, have liked it to have been in the underlying bill here, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take the Rules Committee making it in order as an amendment. And, and to quote one of our colleagues, and one that I believe uh, our friend from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, might uh, also quote in a bit, there is a distinction between, and we could have a debate, by the way, about whether insurance companies and other private entities should be able to buy all this data anyway. That's worthy of a debate. But in this context, it is a really critically uh, important distinction that a private entity like an insurance company buying up this private data versus 
a law enforcement entity, be it the FBI or local law enforcement, buying up this data, exceptions notwithstanding for publicly available stuff like license plates and other things. <coughs> because why? Because they can arrest you. Because they can bring the power of government against you. Is that, would you agree? One of our colleagues said, you know, we, we would all, I, I, one of our colleagues on the Judiciary Committee uh, said we'd all be safer if we had a soldier in everyone's home, but we, we made a decision several years ago not to go that route, right? <laughs> I mean, that's just, just, that's what we did. So it's, it's called freedom, it's called liberty, and it's important. Um, and we think we have struck exactly the right balance, consistent with the Constitution, consistent with our checks and balances and separate and equal branches of government and how we've structured this. Um, again, I just hope we can win on the, on the vote tomorrow on the floor. I know there's another amendment. I'll, I'll, I'll go past that one, the abouts amendment, just in the interest of appeal. I know you guys all believe those three amendments are really important. Uh, there, there's another uh, amendment that, that, that I'm offering that I'd offered in committee uh, that uh, would allow for uh, certain members to uh, be present in FISC proceedings. Uh, the amendment would allow the eight plus judiciary chairman and ranking member. Uh, that's a modification, by the way, of where it was. We were going to say that any member of Congress could, you know, uh, obviously subject to all the classified requirements that we're all subject to, uh, be able to go attend a FISC proceeding. That provision, which we included in the Judiciary Committee, Mark, uh, was removed in the uh, efforts to kind of reach some consensus. And I, I'm offering an amendment to put that back, uh, as well as a provision that would require quarterly reporting requirements. I gave in to the uh, uh, ranking member and the chairman to make it a quarterly instead of monthly. There was pushback that the FBI is incapable of doing that, of incapable of putting together quarterly reporting requirements. So in my benevolence, I put in a one-year build-out for them to be able to comply with the onerous requirements of quarterly requirements to Congress in the amendment that I'm putting forward. Would the gentleman uh, uh, opine as to you think the merits of this? And I, I, will, I will lead into that. Is, is your but, amendment now a year or a quarter? It's, it's, well, I, I give them a year before it applies so they okay. can get their okay. systems okay. in order, you know, because they can't possibly put a post-it up and write down how many times you know, uh, people, uh, Americans have been targeted in, the, in this uh, database. So, uh, but in doing so, the, re the reason I believe it's important, I just wonder if the gentlemen agree, is because notwithstanding getting warrants, notwithstanding getting all of these protections in place, there's still the possibility that people who want to abuse the system may, for example, rubber stamp those warrants, that there may still be a, a lot of questions about what happens in these FISC proceedings. So having the ranking member or the chairman of judiciary be able to attend a FISC proceeding, being able to check the uh, interests of, of the executive branch. Because for example, right, political appointees from reviewing this stuff is worthless if we block that, right? It's like one of my colleagues said, I think it was Dr. Burgess, uh, you know, Lisa Page and Peter, uh, they were career employees, right? And so we, we need to have the check of the Article One going over there and saying, and then getting it, it's a mix of Article One and, 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 and three over there, but go over there to the FISC and say, hey, what are you doing? And then the quarterly reports would give us more, I think it ought to be monthly or daily, but real-time understanding of are they targeting Americans or not? And I just wonder how the gentlemen feel about it. Well, I don't think it's crucial, but I do think it's useful, and I'll support it. Yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's a good idea, and I'd support it as well. Um, well, with that, I, uh, I believe that uh, uh, we're heading in the right direction. I'm still reserving judgment uh, based on how this plays out. Um, I, I hope that we'll proceed at least with the base plus these amendments and have the debate down there. But I will say the last point I'll make is one of my flags that are always up in this town is that we have the facade of regular order that is sometimes not regular order because something gets pre-cooked uh, behind closed doors. And so you get an amendment that's already been decided. And I've seen evidence of this. I've seen things where you get placebo type amendments and things. And we've been trying to avoid that here. And I will, I will uh, compliment the Speaker's office and, and uh, the, the Judiciary Committee uh, chairman and ranking member as well as uh, Intel uh, for so far moving down the line where we can get these votes on these amendments and hopefully have a real debate about this rather than using the obfuscation of intelligence and danger of the American people to scare them away from doing the right thing to make sure we're preserving civil liberties. I yield back. Oh, well, this is the ranking I, member. I just want to say that, uh, reiterate that I hope the committee will not make in order the three Intel Committee mem uh, amendments that I've mentioned. Uh, we could spend a lot of time on the floor, and I don't know what the vote would be, but uh, they're, from a civil liberties point of view, they're very harmful and they're totally unnecessary. Well, let me uh, associate myself with your remarks about my personal preference.
you could list uh, a lot of reasons why I would never go into politics. Um, I'll give you two words. Jim Jordan. Can you imagine having to deal with Jim Jordan in any uh, capacity, any level? Never mind having to debate him. I've never heard Jim Jordan say or do anything which is relevant, which is important to, well, I don't know, improving our lives. All you ever hear Jim Jordan do is make sure he's going to say something that at some stage he can run to Fox News and then gesticulate about it. That's it. And uh, the only person that seems to do well, and I give them this, uh, out of anything Jim Jordan, Jim, Jordan, Jim Jordan does or says, the guy who sells him the shirt and tie. You see any other benefit of what Jim Jordan has to say? Comment section's all yours.